Good morning and welcome to the 33rd uh, Learn with Lorna. I'm just going to wait a second for people to join us. So, uh, as I said, welcome to this morning's Learn with Lorna. This is uh, the 33rd of this series, which is quite extraordinary. Um, I'm going to start initially by just saying um, I I have moved house in the last week. So if my Wi-Fi drops out, that's why. So I'm hoping it doesn't and I'm sure it won't. But just uh, to, to preface this talk with that. Um, so hello everyone already saying hello. It's always so nice to see the hellos coming in and where people are watching from. It's always really nice to see that we have people who come every week uh, all the time and people who come for the first time. It's it's really lovely to see all your names coming up and, and where you are. Um, so yeah, thank you for joining me. Thank you for your comments and thank you for your previous comments, which are really appreciated. Before I go any further, just uh, to start, as I always do, by saying that this series is brought to you by uh, by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer, that High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland, and that there's no payment or subscription required to take part uh, in these events. Oh, good. I'm glad I've got some people saying hello from Caithness. I've got some fabulous Caithness stuff coming in So, um, in this talk. Um, of course, we have we're in November, so the month of remembrance. Uh, we've had remembrance yesterday, of course, uh, was Armistice Day, and I'm sure many of you will have observed the two-minute silence uh, on those occasions. And it was funny. I was back in work yesterday in the archive centre for the first time for a full day's work in the building for the first time since March, which is quite uh, extraordinary. So obviously, I've worked through, but I have not been in the building. And and we always mark the two-minute silence and. Um, it was it's it's always a special moment as we all sort of come together as much as we can at the moment uh, and st and stand out and remember and obviously a lot of what we do in our job is remembering uh, and thinking back on people and lives and experiences that have shaped uh, the highlands and so we always uh, find it important to, to mark that um, you'll maybe remember that I've looked previously at World War Two. Believe it or not, that was seven months ago. When I looked back to find the date, it was in April that I last looked at World War Two. Um, and that time I talked about how the war was seen through school logbooks. So how uh, the outbreak of war was recorded, how um, the, the impact on the land, the impact on the young people having to work even more on the land because the men obviously being called away the impact on young people of having to learn military drill and do evacuate, uh, be evacuated uh, and do uh, um, gas mask training and so on. So talked about that and last time talked uh, a little bit about letters as well. So I looked at a letter from somebody on the home front, uh, a lady called Betsy, and somebody uh, on the war front, uh, a lady called Hugette Verhaeg, who served uh, in the French resistance. So please do go back and watch that one. If you haven't seen it, um, you can see it on uh, Facebook or on YouTube. And obviously through other weeks as well, I've touched on the impact of World War II. Um, the Duncan McPherson collection in Sky talks about the loss that that family sustained when Duncan McPherson's son died in the war. West Highland Museum has references to the commandos. AI Welders, uh, a huge part of that company's history was um, their part in the war effort in both world wars and uh, welding Spitfire hubs and so on in the Second World War. So I have touched on the Second World War throughout the intervening weeks and I find it really interesting to see the, the huge extent to which both both the First and Second World War, these conflicts have, have had such a massive impact across the country. Of course they've had, a, a, the conflict had an, an impact on businesses, on communities and, and of course on families and, and on individual lives. And so this week I wanted to follow up on World War II, give some more stories and obviously tie it in this week to, uh, to the theme of remembrance as it's fresh in, in all of our heads at the moment. So I'm going to look at some more stories within our collections. For those of you who haven't taken part in this series many times, um, we have four archive centres across the Highlands. We have one in Inverness, one in Wick, one in Fort William and one in Portree. 
And what I'm trying to do through this series is introduce some of the collections from across the offices. And so for this week, uh, I'll be looking at some in Caithness and some in Fort William. I won't go at all into the details of the war other than to just give you a reminder of the dates that, the, the, as many of you will be familiar, the Second World War from September 1939 to September 1945, uh, six years of uh, gruelling and intense conflict. So I'm going to start in the north um, looking at the bank roll bombing in Wick and that's why I'm saying I'm glad there's, there's some people from Caithness because I've got some fantastic things from Caithness in, in this. Um, so on the 1st of July 1940, Wick suffered the first daytime bombing raid on mainland Britain of anywhere in World War II, which I find absolutely extraordinary, you know, and, and I've touched on this quite a lot through the weeks that people sometimes think that in the Highlands we're on the outskirts of things or we're um, a little bit removed from, from what the rest of the world is doing. But the first place in mainland Britain to be bombed was Wick. It, as I say, it was the 1st of July. It was um, obviously summer. It was a fine day. There was low hanging cloud, but it was quite mild and warm. And a lot of the children were playing outdoors because it was a school holidays. And at 4.30 p.m., a plane, one plane, uh, appeared out of this thick, low hanging cloud. And it dropped 200 pound bombs very close together. There were some reports of some people thinking it was only one bomb because they were in such quick succession and so close together. Um, and it dropped these bombs on Bank Row, which is in Pontley Town, which is uh, down near the harbour in Wick. Because there had been such low cloud that day, the plane was not sighted, so there was no warning of it, no advance warning, no air raid sirens, um, no preparation, no time for anybody to hide. And so 15 people were killed uh, on that day. And eight of those were children who were out playing in the street. And you can imagine what an extraordinary impact that would have had on a town like Wick to just the conflict, which maybe at one point had seemed quite far away, is suddenly on your doorstep. Um, the bombs, it's believed, have been aimed for Wick Harbour uh, and the defences nearby, which would, of course, make sense. Um, but instead, what happened was it was complete destruction of one house, uh, of one shop, sorry, five other shops were partially destroyed, 30 uh, injured casualties, and as I said, those 15 fatalities. Um, I think what I would like to do on, on this day, because we are so close to remembrance, uh, to, to Armistice Day, is just give you the names of those people. It, it's worth, I think, just recording the names of those people who lost their lives that day. Um, so they are Frederick Blackstock, who was aged five, Elizabeth Miller, age five, John Wares, age five, Isabel Bruce, age seven, James Bruce Flett, age seven, Kenneth McGregor, age eight, Amelia Miller, who was nine, Donald Thompson, who was 16, Isabel Mackenzie, 25, Private Robert Mackenzie, 30, Mary Mac McTavish, 44, Mary Stephen, 45, Donald Waters, 50, William Smith, 63, and Robert Mackenzie, who was 71. The reason, other than just acknowledging those lives, th that I wanted to, to read that list out is just to show, as we know, just a reminder that conflict and war very rarely, rarely distinguishes between age or gender or whether you're a civilian or a soldier. Um, you know, the conflict takes no prisoners in some in some respects, those people are aged from five to 71 and there are two families within that as well. Um, so a huge impact on a, on a relatively small community. So the site of that bombing in Wick is now a memorial garden and the walls, uh, up there's a wall with those names uh, inscribed in it. And there was a further bombing in Wick that year in October in, in Hill Avenue, which interestingly is uh, on the road, on the way up to our archive centre in Wick, you uh, can go up through Hill Avenue. Um, and so there was a second bombing and those names are also on that memorial. If uh, any of you are familiar with Wick Voices, I'm sure you will be, um, which was a, uh, which, which is a fantastic uh, organisation, a fantastic um, resource for people interested in the history of Caithness. So if you would like to go and have a look at um, their collections, one of the people who survived the 
Hill Avenue um, bombing called George Cameron has done an oral history and that can be heard on there of what his experience was of, of that bombing in Wick. So I'm going to stay in Caithness for the next story. Um, we have, as you'll know from, from watching me through these series of talks, we have so many collections, so many diverse subjects covered within the collections that we hold. And some others that tell the story of World War II uh, as, as it happened in Caithness are the Northern Constabulary records and the Home Guard records. And these uh, were brought to my attention by one of my colleagues, Anne Mackay, who works uh, in Nucleus, who is writing a blog on these collections and was just blown away by the stories she found. So I'm going to tell you some of those stories, but then I do encourage you to have a look at Anne's blog when it comes out on the Nucleus website. Um, Nucleus is our archive centre in Wick. So I want to have, first of all, a quick look at the Northern Constabulary records held in Caithness. And Again, there's, there's so many stories I could pull from within any of these collections, but what I wanted to tell you was the story, the evidence that these records provide, provide with us of survivors who have come ashore from um, bombings at sea. And so there's an, uh, in the Northern Constabulary collection, we hold Northern Constabulary records in all four of our offices. Um, they're fantastic. They're, they're so full of um, information, daily information and unusual event information. And the 15th of June 1940, so this, um, you know, these things are all happening concurrently. Um, at 2 p.m. on the 15th of June 1940, the controller in Wick sent a message um, to the district commissioner in Inverness to say that 64 males eight, and eight females, who were the survivors of two Norwegian ships that had been bombed, had arrived in Thurso the previous night. And these records record the discussions uh, about the people, about who they are, about where they've come from, what's what's happened to them, what their experience has been, and what the county is going to do with, with these survivors. And so the, there's kind of backwards and forwards discussion. And it turns out that these survivors were from two ships, so they're from the Ariadne and the Prince Olaf. And these two ships had been sunk, uh, they'd been bombed when they were about 60 miles off the Norwegian coast. They were unarmed ships, they were unaccompanied, they had no escort, um, and so not military ships. They were sunk about, as I say, about 60 miles off the coast of Norway. So they took to their lifeboats, the, the crew uh, took to the lifeboats. But the planes that had bombed the ship then machine, opened machine gun fire on the lifeboats. So they sank the lifeboats, and these 64 men and eight women were in the water. And it's, you know, not famously a warm sea. They were in the water for over an hour before a British destroyer picked them up. They were then taken to Scapa Flow, which um, I'm sure some of you will be familiar with uh, in Orkney, which during the First and Second World War was uh, the principal naval anchorage of the Royal Navy. And so they were taken to Scapa Flow and then brought down to Caithness. And as I say, they, the vessels had been unarmed and unescorted and had been kind of out of the blue, had been bombed. And what I find particularly kind of touching and affecting about that story is that not only were the ships bombed, but when they took to that refuge of the lifeboat, that was bombed too. So it wasn't enough to, to destroy the ships. It was uh, trying to sink those lifeboats as well. And then a similar thing happened again in, in the July, and this time there were 33 uh, sailors who arrived uh, in Thurso, and they were Danes, Swedes, Norwegians. And on both occasions, the, the county of Kithnes came together and kind of rallied to support them, to give them food, to put them up in a hotel, um, to keep them until they were either transferred further south or sent home. And one of the organisations who helped in this uh, looking after the people while they were there was the Home Guard. And when Anne, my colleague in, in Nucleus, was, was talking to me about this, she said, you know, you'll be, you'll be guilty, as I was, of thinking Home Guard and thinking Dad's army uh, and kind of smiling as I thought of it. But I wonder if this will change your mind as it, as it changed Anne's. 
The Home Guard were originally called the Local Defence Volunteers. They became known as the Home Guard in 1940, when uh, not long after Winston Churchill came into office. As you'll maybe be familiar, the Home Guard was created to give a role to those who weren't eligible for military service. So if people were too young or too old or too infirm to serve in the military, or if they were in reserved occupations, so things like um, engineering, mining, all, all sorts of uh, occupations that were considered vital to the war effort at home. And those men weren't allowed to go and, and join the army or join the forces. And so instead, they were um, asked to volunteer for the Home Guard. Now, the aim of the Home Guard was to slow any advance of an invading force. And it was believed, absolutely believed at the time that this was imminent, that there was an imminent invasion and that it would take time for our forces to get back to uh, to fight off an invading force. And so the Home Guard's role was to slow the advance of anyone invading, to defend the key locations. So things like communication sites, factories, um, ports, things like that. And just keep general order and calm and, and basically just hold the fort until the army arrived. Um, so if there had been an invasion, which of course there wasn't in, in, in mainland Britain, but if there had been an invasion, they would have been an absolutely frontline key organisation to, to protect the nation. Um, in Caithness, loads of people signed up immediately. Lots of people volunteered, huge numbers. And they were led uh, for the majority of, of the war by Captain Ian McCarty. Um, I don't know if you remember on a, on a previous episode, I talked a little bit about David Barragill Keith, who was uh, served in the forces from Caithness and did some fantastic caricatures of people that he had come across in his time serving. And he did a caricature of Ian McCarty and he wrote on it, and I want to get the wording right, a genuine wee free and a conservative, somewhat narrow-minded, but overall an excellent fellow, typical Scots university student. Not sure how I feel about that. Um, as I say, lots of people immediately signed up in Case Ness to join the Home Guard and their volunteers reached over 1,500 and at which point they became known as the 1st Caithness Battalion. And this Home Guard collection that, that we hold uh, in our Caithness archives includes all sorts of things, um, memorandums, orders, for, in, in, including things that you'll be familiar with through TV series and things, things like taking down all the road names so that if an, arm, an enemy uh, army landed, they wouldn't know where they were going, which direction. So taking down the signs, instructions for practice marches, for familiarising themselves with the local area and the places that were uh, important and key sites, training exercises, air raid duties. Um, and what's really fascinating is the description of the role play activities that they were going to do. So what they call post blitz scenarios. It's terrifying. I mean, it, it's genuinely something that's quite shocking to read. And obviously I didn't live through any of it, but it's it, it has an effect on you to read these things. So post blitz um, scenarios. So these are instructions for how to prepare for what to do in the, an event, in the event of a blitz. They are very detailed instructions with an hour by hour, uh, day by day guide of what was gonna happen. So details of all the people who would be involved, all the organizations. So there are representatives from the Seaforth Highlanders, from the Cameron Highlanders, from the Home Guard, from the Red Cross, things like that. And each one will give you the, the overall objective of what the exercise is, what they're hoping to achieve, who's taking part, who's playing the enemy. And um, so they'll list the organisations that are playing, um, you know, the allied forces and the organisations that are playing the enemy forces. And it would record in there exactly what the enemy action was going to be. So if the enemy were walking through the streets or taking over the aerodrome, and then an instruction of what the reaction should be and how the Home Guard should should act in any of these scenarios. And all of these things were observed by people called umpires. The, the obvious meaning of the word, just that they are there to, to observe and, and to um, kind of take notes and judge, basically. So they would wear white armbands, so they were distinguishable from those role playing and acting in it. And then they would record what was happening and basically have a debrief afterwards and report what had gone well and what hadn't gone well. 
So all this is happening in Caithness and of course lots of things are happening throughout the country, throughout the Highlands of, of a similar nature. Um, if any of you live in Sutherland, uh, you'll maybe be familiar, I, I write a monthly article for the Northern Times newspaper in Sutherland and this month I've, I've done it on a similar theme on, on Remembrance and on uh, World War II. And it was very interesting as I was preparing for that article, looking through the Sutherland County Council minutes, the Dornach Borough Council minutes, to see the huge extent of preparation before the war and during the war of ARP st uh, stations being set up. The golf course, the golf links being requisitioned for, as an aerodrome in, in Dornach, the establishment of food control committees, things like that. So this level of um, administration and, and local government churning out um, preparation is of course happening all over the country at this time. I'm going to go in just a second from north to south and have a wee look at what's happening in Loch Aber but before I do so uh, to remind you that these talks are brought to you by Highlife Island at no cost to the viewer and that Highlife Island is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part but if you are able to donate towards our work we would really very much appreciate that and there's a link to be able to do so within the Facebook page um, or come back to us and ask for that, we can certainly provide you with details. So, as I say, moving from the north of the Highlands uh, down to the south, and I'm aware that there are so many other stories I could be telling of, of those serving and those uh, I'm missing out huge swathes of the Highlands, but I only have half an hour. Um, we'll have to turn the next series, next year we'll have to do sort of three hour long learn with Bournemouth. Um, so we're going to Loch Aber now to see what was happening there. And for this section, I'm going to use the Cameron head of, now, it's either Inver Alert or Inver Alert, so it depends. So I'm sorry if I offend anyone who lives there by saying it the wrong way around, um, and I'll probably change as I go through. So I'm going to use the Cameron head of Inver Alert collection. This is um, such an interesting collection. I may well do just a, an, an episode of this on that collection alone, but for now, um, I'm using some extracts from this to talk about what was happening in Loch Aber in World War II. Um, Inverailer is in the Moidart area, so on the west coast of Scotland, southern west coast of the Highlands. It's kind of variously called Inverailer House or Inverailer Castle, but a big, substantial uh, and uh, important building. The building was built in about the 1700s, additions in the 1800s, um, just to give you an idea of the sort of building. And it was requisitioned in both the First World War and the Second World War. And within this collection, the Cameron, Cameron Head collection, we hold papers about the requisition. So we hold, um, <laughs> yes, you're right, Jenny, it would be a midnight finish. Maybe I won't do a three hour one. Um, the, we hold papers about the requisition of Inverie Alert Castle, um, including the original requisition form, which is signed by uh, Major William Salmond, and he is exercising the powers invested in him to take over the land and the buildings for military purposes, as happened through so many buildings throughout the country. And as of, was often the case, the requisition was swift and fairly brutal. Um, and there are papers within this collection that talk uh, about Christian Cameron Head. So she was uh, the landowner at the time. And she's writing to Donald Cameron of Loch Eel asking for his advice because she had been in London with her son. Her son was having an operation. He was in very uh, weak health and she was in London with him getting an operation. And she got a telegram to say that Inver Alert was going to be taken over by the military. And so she she tried to get back as quickly as she could, but by the time she got back, the house had already been taken over. So the house was already taken over, military were already established, there was camps being set up on the grounds, the furniture had already all been taken to storage in Fort William and, and a fair amount of it was completely destroyed en route. And she should have had 10 days warning to know that this was going to be happening, but she'd had uh, no warning at all. And by the time she'd got there, it had all happened and she had nowhere to live. Um, and within this collection, there's a document that shows what could be done with the house when it was taken over by the military. And so it said it could be used for any military purposes until further notice. So it's a kind of cover all statement that we, we need buildings and we just need them and we'll take them. Um, could be used for training and drills, for digging exercises. All public rights of access across the land were stopped. Um, there was no grazing of animals allowed on the land except at certain times. And there was no work allowed on the land except at certain times. Um, so a huge shift in what was happening. And it's funny because 
obviously your instinct is of course if if you need land to to win a war you take it but the other part of you is going that's not fair um and there are records in the collection about all sorts of damage that were done when the, the land was taken over. There was antique furniture destroyed. There are lists of missing items, including jewellery and snuff boxes used by Bonnie Prince Charlie and um, diaries and all sorts of things. And then on the estate itself, bridges were destroyed, fences were broken down, walls and gates and roads all destroyed. And so, of course, compensation claims had to be put into the military after the war about um, repairs to those things. But why why did this all happen? Why was Inverary Alert so important? What was it used for? Why was it so vital that the military took it over? And it is absolutely fascinating. It's such an interesting, um, such an interesting story. So the house and the estate were used by the special services units. So initially it was Lord Lovett, and I've talked about many Lord Lovetts through this series. Um, but it was taken over initially by Lord Lovett, requisitioned it, and it was used intensively for training um, commando units and special units. And it was the first training school for a special operations um, executive. So it was a training school in unconventional and unusual war tactics. The house and grounds, as I said, were completely taken over and there was a large um, hutted camp set up on the grounds. And it was absolutely vital. It was it was a key place for training people in unconventional tactics, which of course became very important. And in the collection, there are passes for family members to be allowed to enter the grounds of their own house. Uh, and on certain occasions, they were they had to uh, approach the military, get a signed pass to say that they were allowed to enter the grounds of the house. Um, and what's really interesting was the house was originally taken by the army, so it was taken for infantry training, um, but then it was transferred to the Royal Navy in August uh, 1942. It was transferred to the Royal Navy for commando training and from then on became known as HMS Loch Eilert, which I, it's just so quirky. So they, because it was run by the Navy, it was designated as an as an uh, a ship, so it was called HMS Loch Eilert. And within the building now, there are still uh, there's still signage in the building written on doors and so on. So there's a door that says ship's office typing pool and things like that, and that still exists in the building. So it was requisitioned in 1940, transferred back to the family in 1945. And as I say, a huge amount of, of damage done in that time, but something that was absolutely key to the war effort. Incidentally, Francis uh, Cameron Head, who was Christian Cameron Head's son, so he was the one who was in, having the operation in London when she heard about the requisition. He had been, he had signed up, had a commission, sorry, for the military, but had been in two week health to be able to see it through and so had gone um, instead into the Home Guard. So it kind of takes us full circle. He became Lieutenant in the 2nd Invernessshire Battalion of the Home Guard. And this collection also includes Home Guard documents orders and circulars and correspondence, regulations, things like that. And in addition to that, it holds the ration books and identity cards uh, of various family members, including Francis and his wife, Pauline, who uh, went by the fabulous nickname of Pucci. Um, and she was an ambulance driver in the Second World War. So there's all sorts of information within this collection as well. Um, I'm going to stop talking there for the first time in a few weeks. I'm going to finish on time. Um, I hope that that has been of interest to you. I hope there were some stories in there that you didn't know about what happened in the Highlands during the Second World War and how vital the Highlands was, both in terms of preparation for what might happen and for training those to go abroad to fight in what did happen. Um, an extraordinary time in the Highlands history, as it was in, in everybody's, of course. And yeah, I hope there are some things in there that you didn't know. Um, I would encourage you, if you're able to, to read Anne's blog. On, it will be going up in the Nucleus site uh, in December, so please do have a look out for that. And also I'd like to put out a, a plea to anyone watching this who uh, is long term in the Highlands or has a long term connection to the Highlands. We're trying to pull together some oral histories. We, we want to gather the stories of the people who remember uh, living through the Second World War, 
or the impact of the Second World War on their community. And so if you remember the Second World War or um, any particular stories about it, please do contact us because we would love to interview you and record those stories so they can be kept in our collections for, for long for long term preservation so that future generations can hear those voices and, and know those stories. Um, so please do contact us if you're able to do that. And I know some of you I know have interesting World War II stories. Um, thank you for saying it's never long enough. I know I feel like that as well. Um, and yes, Fiona, I need a pass to get into the area at all. Yeah, First World War and Second World War, special military area. Uh, next week, I hope you can join me again. We will be looking at the history of the Caledonian Canal, which again is another really interesting story and another um, development that had a huge impact uh, on the Highlands and continues to do so. So I hope you can uh, join me next week for that. A final reminder uh, that this series is brought to you by High Life Island at no cost to the viewer and that High Life Island is a charity registered in Scotland and that there's no payment or subscription required to take part in these. Uh, I hope you can join me next week and I hope you can watch this and some other ones back uh, in our YouTube channel as well. But I'll look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you again for all your comments. They are so much appreciated. Thank you.